a factory inspector found children who legally were supposed to be in school. But she asked them, would you rather work in a factory or go to school? And out of 500 or so children, 80% said they'd rather work in a factory than go to school. That says something really dismal about what schools were like at that time. School buildings were dangerous places. They were dark, they were drafty, they were cold. I remember my mother telling me that as a teacher of immigrants, she got diphtheria, she got scarlet fever, and she had to deal with children who were very ill themselves and who did not have appropriate medical care. Change was in the air and in the streets. Progressive reformers claimed that too many Americans were spending their childhood in drudgery rather than in school, preparing for a better life. They lobbied for the enforcement of state laws that banned child labor and made school attendance compulsory. The next step for progressive reformers was to change the practice of education itself. The standard method of teaching in most urban schools was quite literally to toe the line. That is, the children were expected to come up front and recite to the teacher and stand with their toes lined up to the boards and their hands in a particular place as they recited their lesson. The rigid curriculum of the day was attacked in an 1899 book called The School and Society by John Dewey. A philosopher at the University of Chicago, Dewey would become known as the father of progressive education. The educational center of gravity has been too long in the teacher, the textbook, anywhere and everywhere you please, except in the immediate instincts and activities of the child himself. John Dewey believed that if schools were anchored in the whole child, in the social, intellectual, emotional, and physical development of a child, that teaching would be different and that learning would be different and that schools would be very different, hospitable places for children. At the 1900 World's Fair in Paris, Americans proudly put their schools on display. They exhibited photographs of the new progressive techniques. Children learning by doing. Exercising their bodies as well as their minds. And venturing out of the classroom to explore the world of work and the wonders of nature. Back home, child-centered education quickly spread, even to the industrial city of Gary, Indiana, where students got to take advantage of the most progressive school system of all. Emerson School had at least two city blocks for territory, large athletic fields, a beautiful playground area, and one of the things that I remember there was visiting their zoo. I can remember bears, but nothing bigger than that. And Horace Mann, where I went to school, and in front of our campus, the major entrance, there was a beautiful lagoon, and the swans were always out there swimming. The schools were marvelous. As a matter of fact, I had never been in a school where they had a great big swimming pool. The schools of Gary, Indiana, reflected the lofty ambitions of the town itself. In 1906, the U.S. Steel Company had built the world's largest steel mill on the shores of Lake Michigan. A city sprang up almost overnight as immigrants flocked to Gary, looking for work. To assimilate these new arrivals, 
Town leaders hired William A. Wirt as superintendent of schools. A disciple of John Dewey, Wirt designed lavish modern buildings that served all grades and a curriculum that kept students in motion. At first, it was a little frightening because I had never been in a school where you moved from class to class at the end of each hour. And I got lost a couple of times. Worth wanted the kids to be running around the school and not have them sit bored in a desk for four or five hours a day, listening to the uh, teacher drone on. What he wanted was for the kids to have a rich school experience. So they were, they were busy all the time and were getting involved in things that would interest them. And if something didn't, something else would interest them. They had so many things. They had a forge and they had auto mechanics. There were all kinds of possibilities. Oh, another one was animal husbandry. And the children learned how to take care of chickens and ducks. We had art classes, we had nature classes. There was so much going on besides our regular classroom work that it was really lovely to go to school. We enjoyed it. All of this was possible and even affordable because of Wirt's split shift system. In the Gary schools, every space from classroom to workshop, from auditorium to playground was in constant use. Work called his system, work, study, play. There are many ways that young people learn. And those in the past who've been rewarded are those who are very verbal or very mathematical and could learn to spell and do their times tables uh, efficiently. But that left behind a lot of students who had other talents and who could contribute those talents to school. Progressive education at its best, I think, has been designed to tap all the talents of the students as opposed to just a narrow band. Gary students helped to run the schools. They printed the school newspaper and the yearbook. The goal of this manual training, a progressive educator said, was to make every working man a scholar and every scholar a working man. In the cafeteria, you, you helped in the mass production of food. I can remember spending a week taking the eyes out of the potatoes. <laughs> I got a C for talking too much while doing it. But in the junior high, I came to have a pretty good idea of the whole cafeteria function and respect for the people who worked there. In the face of massive immigration, Progressives claimed that schools could help to preserve the American way of life. The new Gary curriculum reached into areas like health and hygiene that had little to do with the three R's. These were poor people. I mean, they didn't have indoor plumbing in Gary. They didn't have sanitary facilities. So you brought the kids into the school where you clean them up. Part of the, uh, the reason they have swimming pools in the school was so kids would have a bath. So the school was there to do everything that the parents were not doing. The vice principal would put on an afternoon tea to just show us how we would behave. She would show us such things as a bath mat, which I had never seen before in my life, and I thought it was a towel, and she explained what it was. Um, she would teach us manners that we used here. We had 53 nationalities in Frable School, and we were Americanized. The Gary schools were open at night and on weekends to serve the entire community. Leaders of industry hoped that progressive education would socialize students and their families during this period of widespread labor unrest. The argument is made that the reason there are labor riots and strikes is because the family can't manage their budget. So home economics becomes a big issue. The woman learns how to cook, 
and the worker goes to work well fed and because he knows that there will be a good meal when he returns home he doesn't stop at the saloon and he comes directly home and we'll have industrial peace through home economics. So the school was suddenly the panacea for everything going on in society. The schools of Gary drew visitors from as far away as Japan. Eventually, educators from 200 American cities would adopt Wirt's system. By 1917, New York City Progressive Mayor John Mitchell had put the Gary Plan into action in 30 New York schools. But that move embroiled the school system and the city in a violent controversy. 